Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Bill Schmalzel, a partner in Mayor Brown's Chicago office. I'm a member of the tax controversy group where I represent clients in all stages of tax litigation, including audits, appeals, uh, the tax court, federal district court, and when necessary in the court of appeals. Uh, joining me today as a co-presenter is my colleague, Mike Coppa, who's also a member of our tax controversy team in our Chicago office. Uh, today, we would like to share with you some of our experience in defending research credit claims, uh, focusing on the types of documentation that are useful in supporting those claims. As we go along, we hope that you will ask questions. If you'd like to ask a question during the presentation, please use the Q&A panel on the right side of your screen. Uh, we'll make every effort to answer them towards the end of the webinar. If we are unable to answer your question during the presentation, uh, we will follow up with you directly once the webinar has ended. Regarding CLE credit, we will be providing an alphanumeric code at some point during the presentation. In order to receive the CLE credit, participants must record this code on the virtual sign-in sheet that was emailed to you with the logon instruction for today's program. With that, let's get started. The research credit under Section 41 is one of the primary ways in which the federal government uses the tax code to encourage private investment in research and development. Uh, while this isn't clearly intended to be a government policy, the research credit claims are a surprisingly frequent source of contention with IRS examiners. Indeed, according to the IRS filings, Section 41 is actually the most common source of uncertain tax positions that taxpayers disclose on their Schedule UTP. One of the common issues raised during audits is whether the taxpayer has provided adequate documentation to establish that its research activities uh, meet the requirements of Section 41. Uh, now, this might not seem to be such a difficult problem, uh, but nonetheless it is. Uh, the IRS examiners often want some type of contemporaneous documents uh, that demonstrate that the research was qualified. And indeed, I would say most taxpayers are aware of that uh, objective of the IRS, and they frequently attempt to gather contemporaneous documents as part of their efforts to assemble the research credit claim. Indeed, I've often seen the documents that have been gathered to be fairly voluminous. I um, mean, in times they could fill binders that require many shells to hold. Despite these efforts, there's an unfortunately high number of times where the IRS concludes that the information that's been gathered does not, in fact, establish that the activity was qualified research. Uh, the problem, as I see it, is that neither the statute nor the regulations offer much in the way of clarity as to what, what must be gathered. Uh, it merely says that the taxpayer must retain records in sufficiently usable form and detail to substantiate that the expenditure claimed are eligible for the credit. Uh, the documents that are naturally created in the research process, as we will be talking about today, are not made with the tax code in mind and frequently don't explicitly on their face reference the requirements of the tax code. Uh, the engineers, while they often are trying to be helpful, really don't have an understanding of which documents might be useful for the tax process and therefore don't necessarily help you refine what you're going to need. Furthermore, the IRS examiners themselves, I find, often lack 
a well-defined understanding of the development process and therefore do not state their request in a useful manner. Our goal today is to give you some tools to sort of bridge this gap between the engineers that are conducting the research and the tax requirements to help you select out of what I will say in often cases are many, many documents, which ones are the ones you want to devote your time to collecting, as, particularly as part of your initial effort to do so. Therefore, today we're first going to go over in a fair amount of detail the various types of documents that we see created during a company's product development process. Uh, we'll then turn to talking about how that documentation can be used to substantiate the various requirements under Section 41. Uh, we will then suggest uh, particular document strategies that can relate to particular challenges that we've seen raised by IRS agents. Uh, finally, we will offer approaches to identifying you know, and collecting the initial set of passive documents that you want to put in those binders for when the IRS comes in the door. Our focus today is going to be on the documents that actively relate to showing that you've met the requirements of Section 41. There's often an additional challenge of how you establish the particular cost allocations. Uh, this program is not going to get into that. We may do an additional program in the future that would try to cover that issue. Uh, with that, Mike, could you give us some advice on what types of documents we've found are typically created? Thanks, Bill. Uh Absolutely. So one of the things we like to talk about today is how to better understand what documents are created in the context of your product development process. And as Bill mentioned a moment ago, many taxpayers, of course, produce substantial amounts of research documentation. They can sometimes fill several shelves on your, on your, um, on your bookshelf with many binders. And uh, that part is not necessarily the hard part, but what's often difficult for taxpayers is to select which portions of that documentation are relevant and helpful to you. And so one important step in this process is to develop an understanding of what kind of, kinds of research documentation are produced in the context of your research and development process. Many companies do have a standardized product development process that they employ to produce new types of uh, products. Um, and the, ma the major phases of this research, research, research and development activity um, can be a very useful blueprint for the types of R&D activities that do produce useful documentation for supporting your credit. And in our experience, using these phases to identify and later explain the records to your agent can be very helpful. In a recent tax court opinion, in the case of Souter v. Commissioner, um, the court's opinion goes a long way in helping taxpayers to use their process of experimentation um, to both uh, identify and uh, articulate the importance of that documentation to exam agents. Um, in this case involved a manufacturer of telephone systems, and in this opinion the court um, recognized that the taxpayer's formal product development process um, was key to articulating the importance of each type of activity in the context of its process overall. Um, indeed, the, the, the court looked to the entire development process in, in explaining that each of the activities that made up that process itself could be a qualified activity in the context of Section 41. Um, this case is, is really interesting and important um, in general for, for a lot of taxpayers that are claiming the research credit. And if you're interested in learning more about the Sutter opinion, you can find our prior presentation that Bill and I did back in February of 2014. And those um, slides and as well as the uh, uh, video recording of our presentation are found in our bios on the Mayor Brunt website. So, so what do we mean by product development process? 
Um, in general, you could say that a product development process could be restated to answer three basic questions. What are you going to build? How are you going to build it? And does your design work the way you intended it to? And more, more specifically, many, many formalized processes will include several major phases. There will be typically a concept phase, a planning phase, a design phase, and finally a testing or evaluation phase. And each of these phases will in turn produce certain types of research documentation. And so it's really important to have a good understanding of the major types of documentation that each phase would typically produce. Now one thing we'll add is that sometimes if your company does have a formalized process, oftentimes they'll find a market release phase or some type of activity at the end of that process that releases the product into the commercial space. Um, these, these, these last phases are not often, um, the activities there are not often qualified, qualifying activities and preferred purposes of the research credit, although, you know, certainly for beta testing and, and sorts, of, sorts of activities like that, it can be kind of blurred. So uh, we'll just point out for purposes of this presentation that that type of activity is sometimes a question mark. So let's begin talking about each phase in turn. Um, your company may have different terminology for each types of phases, but um, in, in general, we've, we've often seen um, phases articulated in this, in this way. And the first phase is often called concept. The con at the concept phase, an unmet need is identified and a potential solution is developed. So you'll see researchers and design engineers, sometimes marketing people, um, as well as upper management, um, they all get together and identify an unmet need in the marketplace and begin to develop an idea for a new product. So early stage research is often conducted here, and at the end of this phase, a more formal concept is uh, sketched out. And oftentimes, at the very end of this phase, we'll see a formal review approved for further development. After a concept is developed, oftentimes the next phase is called the planning phase. And during the planning phase, we'll see that the initial concept is further developed into more definite set of systems requirements. And here the roles and responsibilities of each of the functions in the company that will be involved in this new project are laid out in more detail. So project deadlines will be established, as well as any financial and human resource, resources needed, needed to complete the project will also be de determined and, and laid out in more detail. And at the end of this planning phase, we'll find that oftentimes a, a formal project plan will be um, reviewed and approved. And in our experience, these project plans are, are often the most useful documents in the project file. They're not written um, like most research and development documents are to the extent that most of them are very technical and hard to understand for the non-engineer. But project plans are more widely applicable. In other words, they're written in plain English. They're just high-level planning documents that give a very broad overview of the purpose of the project and who's involved and what they're supposed to be doing. So typically, you'll find a business objective to the project being described. There will be project team descriptions project schedules and any budget information available will be described as well, and any assumptions or risks that are involved in that project will be laid out in further detail. And um, what's also very useful, typically you'll find a project deliverables checklist, which will include lists of other types of documents or testing plans or any other major phases of the project will be laid out there as well. After the planning phase, the project often moves into a design phase where engineers will begin to create a physical realization of the new concept. Here you'll find that prototypes are often built and pilot units are designed and built and rigorously tested. Um, the design here is further evaluated and improved through rig rigorous testing and reevaluation and redesign and it's a cyclical process where the design is further refined. So the types of documents you might expect to find here are things like design specifications, um, design analysis testing, 
any kind of testing where it shows a company going through a systematic process to further evaluate the initial design of the product. Now, we've mentioned before how voluminous documentation can get. Note that here, each, each type of, uh, each specific component or maybe each um, feature of the product might have its own plan or, de or design uh, phase. And so the design documents can multiply quite quickly when you're talking about um, each component of the product being designed at various phases of the project. I mean, I think that's a fairly typical thing that we see is that as the a large, really a large project is developed, it keeps getting broken down into nuggets that can be assigned to specific groups of engineers. And therefore, uh, for each of those branches, there'll be this whole group of documents associated with that. And, Therefore, it potentially can multiply very rapidly. Once the initial design is frozen, you'll find that the project then moves into a testing or an evaluation phase. Here, as the phase, the title of this phase suggests, you're simply going through and further evaluating each aspect of the design, making sure that that design meets your specifications. So the types of documentation you might find here, again, you'll find a lot of testing reports, um, you'll find um, further verification and validation type reports where they're further validating that each of these design uh, designs are meeting the specifications as needed. And as we've mentioned, a lot, of this, a lot of these testing reports can be very technical and by themselves might not be that interesting, but keep in mind that all this testing is very critical to the process overall. Some of the other types of documents that you might find being produced in your process could include organizational charts. And these are potentially helpful if, you, if, they, if they list project teams or groups of R&D people associated with certain projects, that can be a helpful roadmap for showing who is involved in the types of projects that you're trying to qualify for the credit. Um, note that not all of the people involved in an R&D project might be listed under the R&D department specifically. Um, as we mentioned earlier, sometimes marketing people are involved in developing early concepts. Um, the production or quality people might be involved. So if you're using org charts, keep in mind that not, not everything is included under the R&D function. You might be able to use some project status meeting minutes. Um, these are often helpful showing an overview of what types of projects are going on. Um, we have a caveat below here that notes that typically these aren't, these aren't going to show you the difficulties or the uncertainties involved in these projects, and we'll explain later in, in context of the elements of the Section 41 credit why that would be important. Um, I've already explained testing reports and, and things of that nature, but keep in mind that testing of incoming components can also be an important type of document. You might have patents as well. Um, the regulations under Section 41 do indicate that the issuance of a patent is conclusive evidence that a taxpayer has discovered information that is technical in nature and that is designed or that is intended to eliminate uncertainty concerning the development or improvement of business components. So keep in mind that if you do have patents issued for certain designs, that is a very helpful fact to establish to help support your credit. We often see exam teams request lab notebooks. Um, those do come with some difficulties. However, they're often very highly technical and difficult to understand for someone who's not an engineer. And just as a practical matter, they're difficult to copy and produce. Um, yeah, where I've often found them to be helpful is not something that I would collect as a general rule, but if you're focusing on a particular person, and whether they've been involved in quality research. Uh, particularly, like in the case of a vice president I once found, he always kept his lab notebook with him all the time. And uh, that was quite useful in showing that he was not merely an administrator. Uh, so I think in cases where you have a particular need, the lab notebook can be uh, helpful. But as a routine matter, they're probably not. And as I explained earlier, a lot of times product development processes will have major phases that describe the types of activity that are, that are done throughout that process. And you might have major phase gate documents that, um, that are 
in the form of sort of a, a formal review that are signed and approved as, as the project moves through the major phases of the process. So we've just provided a, a general overview of the types of R&D processes that might be involved and the types of documents that might be produced during that process. But of course, it's important that each taxpayer understand how their company's process works and the types of documents that might be produced. So you might be asking yourself, you know, how, how can I understand how my company's process actually works? Often the best person to, uh, to educate you on your company's R&D process is the VP of R&D. Um, of course, you know, these are senior executives, they're excellent communicators, and they are probably the best suited to educating you on, on the company's process. But the downside to seeking these individuals out is obviously they're senior executives and their time is limited. They might not have um, the availability to sit down and, and discuss these issues with you. So the alternative is having R&D project leaders or team leaders um, sit down and, and better educate you on, on the nuances of your company's process. It's a little bit easier to get access to their time. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Bill, who's going to further discuss the statutory requirements of Section 41. With that, we will go on, as Mike indicated, to talking about the statutory requirements of Section 41 and how to relate those to the documents that we've just been discussing. Uh, as I'm sure most of you are already familiar with, the basic requirements for establishing qualified research are that the expenditures have to be research and development costs in the experimental or laboratory sense. Uh, then the research must be undertaken to uncover technological information. This sort of extends, you know, excludes things like pure marketing surveys, social science, and the like. Next, the research has to be intended to be useful in the development of a new or improved business component of the taxpayer. I would say this one generally is not much of a dispute. Uh, you know, I think the, even the IRS tends to recognize that companies rarely are undertaking an activity that isn't intended to help them with their overall business. Uh, finally, and where most of the documentation I think relates to, is that substantially all the research and experimentation activities have to constitute the process of experimentation. Now, with those general rules in mind, let's zero in on them somewhat. The, the Section 174 test uh, focuses on there being uncertainty uh, this often is still misinterpreted by agents as about uncertainty as to whether you can actually achieve the result. Uh, that is typically not the problem for uh, taxpayers. I mean, in, for engineering projects, the question is usually, can we find a solution within whatever constraints that we have to undertake, whether it's time, expense of the product, uh, but ultimate success is not frequently the case. Uh, pharmaceutical development is probably the big exception to that where there truly is uncertainty about whether you can achieve this successful drug treatment. But the regulation that we're showing here focuses on the, you only need to have uncertainty about the appropriate design of the product. And this will be uncertain in almost all of the time. Uh, you know, I think here, though, you're going to have to typically argue that it's inferred from the entire process of development, that, uh, you know, the project plans, the uh, if there is one, a standard operating procedure for how to do the research. And you may well have to explain to the agents that this is the reason that the uncertainty of the appropriate design is why you're undertaking the overall research project. Uh, 
you know, I mean, to the engineers writing the project plans, there is no, you know, it's so obvious to them that they're undertaking it because they have an uncertainty. You're not typically going to find your project plan identifying explicitly, we have uncertainty about how to build X. I mean, that's taken as a given. Uh, you may find, you know, in some of the early concept documents, uh, people discussing which of various routes that they're going to go down. So, I mean, if, if you're looking for more evidence of uncertainty about which pattern, I would suggest looking at the concept things. Uh, design reviews or concept review documents are another place where uh, you may find some references to the consideration of different alternatives. However, I would say that the, you know, you, you're generally going to be arguing from the overall process that is shown in the project plans rather than any particular document. Uh, then you have the requirement that the information that you're discovering be technological in nature. Uh, again, I think what you're going to show it here is more from the collective documents. Uh -huh. You know, you will be able to show by collect, uh, collecting various ones that there has been a very systematic process that is typical of engineering. This is where you get into showing, you know, samples of those requirement documents we mentioned, design plans, design specifications, functional plans, uh, test reports. So while in, any individual document is not likely to explicitly show the technological aspect of it, if you put enough of them together, it shows that the process is definitely following well-established engineering concepts there. Um, you are also, you know, if you're looking for evidence of what business component you're looking at, I would suggest there you want to go back to the concept documents. Uh, often we found in these types of project plans are a good place because they tend to set up right at the front what they're trying to accomplish. And that's usually written in a way that's understandable by lay uh, people as to what, what business component you would be talking about. So, you know, for your business component, I would suggest that that is where you're likely to be looking for documents. Uh, you know, one of the essences of the process of experimentation is the identification of evaluating alternatives. Uh, and here, I would suggest you want to look ultimately at the uh, test plans, not so much the individual test reports, uh, but I frequently see fairly early on in the development process that the company will try to outline which steps it t intends to take in the, to test whatever they've developed. So that test plan I find helpful. I would look for some samples of the actual tests, but those tend to be so detailed, I would say those are not uh, as useful in being a descriptive document. You, you want enough to show that the testing occurs, but uh, collecting all of them is probably not helpful. Now, I've been focusing the, thus far on showing how the overall requirements of Section 41 are met. However, we frequently see that there are sometimes targeted areas where the IRS is challenging, not the overall research, but some particular aspects of it. And the various documents that we've been talking about can also help us with addressing some of the particular areas that we've often seen raised. Uh, one set of cost centers that we frequently find the IRS wanting to kick out from it 
are the quality centers and the production centers. Mike, could you talk a bit about how this, these documents might be used in addressing that? Sure. So quality and production departments uh, face a challenge for, for similar reasons, and that is these people, while they are involved certainly in the product development process, they also do other things that might not be involved, that might not be part of the R&D process. You know, certainly quality engineers test commercialized products that are already in the commercial space, while they also test, you know, for quality and in incoming components that are involved in a, in a new product project. Um, production employees similarly certainly manufacture products for commercial sale, but they also manufacture pilots and prototypes that involve, you know, certainly important for um, developing and testing new products. So uh, we find that these types of departments sometimes face challenges when you're trying to qualify their activities for purposes of Section 41, but we have certain documents that we have found to be helpful in uh, qualifying and help, helping to support your, your claims for these types of employees. And one type of document that we find helpful is the project plans. We've mentioned these before, but certainly the project plans might be really helpful in identifying the, um, the departments or cost centers that are responsible for the prototypes and pilot builds. You know, specific, speaking specifically about the production departments, um, these project plans can help explain to your agent that not only is the production manufacturing departments responsible for, for building commercialized units, but they also are sometimes involved in building the prototype and pilot units um, for new project products that are being built. So that, that's a very helpful way to show um, the activity of, of, of those groups. I mean, in some cases, I've actually seen the project plans give responsibility for building the, the pro prototypes to, you know, the production group and the testing to a quality group. If, if, that, if your documents are that explicit, it's very helpful. Yeah. And once again, test plans, as Bill mentioned before, are also really helpful. These can help show the, the iterative nature of product development. You, you don't have to reinvent the wheel in your in your R&D process in order to qualify for Section 41. The test plans help the agents understand that each of these te quality testing type of activities, each, each activity in its own right is very important in the process overall. And similarly for the supplier component testing, it, make sure and explain to your agent as well that testing incoming components is, is very important for making sure that when your test results come out from your testing, you have to understand the incoming components as well to make sure that what you thought was going into your product is what you intended them to be. And what about uh, sort of the high, and I often see in a large company, there's certain departments that are sort of given labels of administrative roles with respect to uh, the research. How would you suggest we use the documents in connection with those? There are certain types of documents that can help you explain to your agent that these administrative personnel are not managing people, rather they're actually managing the research itself. And so they're oftentimes overseeing and, and providing direct support for certain cost centers or, or sub-departments that are itself performing the direct research and development activity. One type of document that we found to be really helpful in this regard is surveys. And of course, many taxpayers use surveys as a way of identifying which cost centers and which employees are performing qualifying activity. Um, the surveys can be very helpful to highlight the role of these administrative employees by um, selecting and highlighting certain cost centers that report to these administrative personnel who are in turn themselves doing the, the direct research and development activity. Project plans can also be helpful to the extent that they um, demonstrate the importance of, of the oversight role that these project managers have because if you have you know, dozens of testing plans that roll up to a particular project, you need someone there to um, orchestrate all that activity to make sense of those tests and the myriad little um, 
you know, engineering tests that take place to feed up to this larger process as a whole. Okay, what about, um, there's sort of questions about whether marketing departments can ever play a role in the research process. What do the documents tell us about that? Marketing is a hard one. Of course, the statute itself does reject certain marketing type activity from the credit, namely marketing research, uh, market testing, any kind of activity where you're researching the market and trying to identify unmet needs is typically not going to qualify for the credit. But the IRS agents often reject marketing-related QREs simply because they're under a marketing function. Um, and that's not always accurate. So as we mentioned earlier, marketing personnel can often be involved in um, helping the companies to develop certain new concepts for new products or taking information from the field and feeding it back to the R&D team to tell them what kinds of features and technology their, their customers are looking for. And this type of activity we think it is qualifying activity and there are certain things you can do to help uh, demonstrate this to your agent. And one thing is looking to concept assessment documents or any type of document where it's showing a list of marketing employees or employees generally who are involved in these concept or marketing meetings. Um, they can often be helpful in demonstrating that certain types of marketing departments are in fact involved in the research process. Yeah, I would say here's one place where I find uh, meeting notes and attendance sheets can be useful. You, know, you can find a meeting that was, you know, substantive in sort of developing the outlines of the concept and you can then couple that with an attendance sheet that shows that the marketing, you know, some individuals from marketing were participating in it. Uh, those can go a long way to establishing the idea that the marketing people were not trying to sell the end product, but they were helping you formulate what features you needed for the product at the outset and that that should be part of the basic research activity of deciding what, what is it you're going to try to develop in the first instance. Okay, we've covered a lot of documents and I imagine that the question therefore can naturally come up as to well, where do I go with all of this? I mean, to literally uh, collect all of the documents that we've talked about for all of the projects the company undertakes would be extremely burdensome, to say the least. Uh, furthermore, absent the case actually going to litigation where you might be forced to put on proof about every transaction, it's highly unlikely that any agent or any appeals officer is truly going to want to look at all of the documents from all of the cases. So you want to have some way of being selective. Uh, while each business will have its own challenges, I would suggest the following model for approaching the problem. First, I would urge that you try to deeply understand your data retention policies and where documents are typically stored. Uh, your goal here is to understand how likely documents are to be available later so that you can assess them. Uh, the more confidence you have that your system will enable documents to be retrieved at a later date, uh, the less you have to worry about collecting currently. Uh, you know, for example, if you have an FDA regulated company, the FDA mandates certain record retention policies for the development of products and medical devices. And if you're in such an environment, you have a fairly high likelihood that those documents are going to stay around for a while. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum, you know, if you're finding documents that only seem to be retained in the office of the individual working on the project, uh, those documents have a lot more risk of being lost 
uh, the individual can move offices, they can leave the company. Uh, so if you're finding documents are almost all in individual offices, I would suggest you need to think about collecting more at the outset because it may be much harder two or three years down the road to go back and find those documents. Uh, I would also urge that you want to try to understand where the particular types of documents would be stored. You know, are there particular places where test reports or requirement documents or specifications are kept? Uh, you know, this location of where documents are, I often, another place where I often find the project plans to be useful. They sometimes outline, uh, you know, what the, the documentation policies are going to be for a particular project and that can give you a guide to where different types of documents can be found. Uh, I would also suggest being somewhat of a detective at looking at the documents that you do see. Um, there's frequently patterns that can be helpful. I mean, I've often seen, you know, strategies like, you know, all projects, all documents related to project X will begin with the same four-digit number. Uh, that can be a way of later on helping you be able to, you know, group uh, documents with a particular project. Uh, alternatively, you may see something like, you know, all test plans are going to be document 500 to 600 or something. So that, again, you can tell, if you understand this, you can tell from the numbering system of your documents how they fit in. Uh, what you're looking for here is to prepare yourself later on for when the IRS agent wants to drill down on a particular type of document. Uh, the better you understand the overall system, the greater the likelihood that you're going to be able to quickly locate documents uh, that are responsive to the request that the IRS may raise. Uh, now, so far I've been talking about, you know, sort of your backup plan for how you fill in the gaps. But what would you want to collect initially? Uh, what I would stress is probably the most important document, if you have it, is the standard operating procedure for your company's product development process. I mean, this is your process of experimentation. Uh, in fact, I would say, you know, if one doesn't exist, I would actually suggest talking to the research group and see if they could at least, you know, do a short outline of how they typically go about the research process. Uh, because if you have sort of the standard operating process, you start from a discussion with the IRS. Is here we have a process of experimentation. This is the overall structure that we're following. Uh, I would then turn to, you know, see if you can find, you know, the project plan or whatever that document is called in your company's uh, lexicon. The goal here is that they are, these documents give an overview of how the process of experimentation is going to be applied to your particular uh, set of problems. Uh, you know, as it goes through, you know, as you develop it, the other documents you collect ideally can be fitted into being demonstrations of how this project plan is being implemented, and it makes the overall story of how you're describing the research, uh, I think, much easier to follow. Uh, you know, uh, so. Okay, that, uh, so these are so important. I would suggest that you actually try to collect as many of the project plans at the outset as possible. Uh, and as I just mentioned, it gives you a high-level description of the project that's accessible to the non-engineers. It often will identify the various members of the team and what departments those come from. Uh, this can be very helpful in enabling you to show how 
the various cost centers that you're claiming credit for fit into the overall uh, research activity. Uh, you may also find that they have uh, examples of uncertainty or what alternatives were discussed as well. Uh, less while they're less hard to find, I would also consider uh, collecting of the patent documents. Those you're not likely to lose. Uh, however, I find that the IRS agents tended to be, I would say, overly impressed by the existence of patents. So collect, if you have a large stack of them to collect at the outset, I would consider getting those together. Uh, or at least if you have many, many patents, just make a listing of all the ones that you have if you think that will look impressive when the agent first looks at the thing. Uh, I would, my next step in the thing would be to try to find specific documents that illustrate what we've just been talking about in the overall process of experimentation and in the uh, project plans. Uh, my goals here are to find documents that, you know, demonstrate that it's a process, that you don't look at just one document that can show that you have a process of experimentation, but rather you have to look at the overall activity. Uh, I'm also looking here to give the agent a sense about how a broad and uninformative request for all documents would be uh, by showing a sample of what occurs. Uh, my goal would be to convince the agent or, if necessary, his manager or the appeals officer that you really don't want to see all of these. Uh, many of them are just not going to be that helpful. Uh, the master set that you collect can also serve as a tool for discussions with the agent later on. If they're talking about what, you know, whether they want to show uncertainty, you can pull this out and say, look, we've given you some test plans. Are you asking for more test plans? Or uh, if you want to know how we refined our thing, do you want to look at more requirement documents? Here's one that we can talk about. Uh, so it gives you a way of having the discussion. I think it also gives you a tool you know, of showing that you've made a good faith effort to educate the exam team about what the research process at your company looks like. Uh, this can be helpful if you have to take it up to the you know, manager level or, again, if you're dealing with the uh, appeals office. Uh, so, I mean, I would try to you know, sort of think of walking through the project plan and looking for what, it, what types of documents does that cover. I mean, I would think of collecting things like the concept documents, the sample requirement documents, specifications, review documents, test plans, some of the uh, actual test documents. Um, I'd consider putting in some meeting summaries if that was appropriate there. Uh, ideally, I'd like to try to collect as many documents as I can from a single project to give sort of continuity that you can kind of, if you have co related documents to a single project, it makes the story easier to tell if you're sitting down with somebody. Uh, that may not be always possible because some projects, you know, take years to complete and therefore you may not have a single project that relates to the years you're trying to gather information for that you can uh, obtain documents for. Uh, but I try to concentrate as many documents as I can from related projects, so that does make for, I think, a more compelling story if you're walking through it with someone. Once I created sort of a master set that illustrates it, I would look for other examples 
of similar documents, you know, two, three, four, not, not, not trying to be exhaustive. Uh, but my goal here is to find, you know, try to be able to show the IRS engineer or agent that, again, you really don't want to see all of these because they're pretty much all the same. You know, I mean, from a engineer's point of view, a specification for widget A can be totally different from widget B. However, from a tax perspective, I would say most agents, most tax people aren't really going to be able to tell the difference. They're going to look very much alike. They're going to be detailing, you know, sort of the same thing. They'll have a lot of numbers. They'll have a lot of detail. Uh, you know, so it really would not be, in my mind, a particularly productive uh, activity to try to collect uh, all of these documents at the outset. Um, and if you can discourage them from looking for them, it's probably in everybody's interest. Okay, well that pretty much takes us to the end. I hope that what we've given you is a way of thinking about understanding your company's research process and how you can use the phases of that research process as a framework for locating uh, key documents that you might have. Uh, I'd urge you to think about which documents are the most important for your uh, demonstrating your system. I've suggested certain documents which I find to be helpful in many situations. Uh, you know, I'd urge you to try to identify where you're going to be able to find additional documents down the road because you don't, in my mind, want to try to actually collect all of them at the outset. I would urge that you focus on trying to uh, try to, you know, explain the statutory requirements to the various engineers or IRS agents. The documents often do not talk, you know, speak for themselves. Uh, so you want to be able to walk people through the documents. Uh, and that, you know, the documents don't always speak to themselves. So, and you know, in some areas, the documents aren't going to be there at all. You're not likely to find that the manufacturing group wrote a little memo saying, you know, this particular production run was intended to resolve the uncertainty of the design. Uh, you'll be lucky if you find, you know, just evidence that they actually produced the documents, I mean, the, the, the test items. You'll have to add the explanation for the uh, so, with that, let's turn to it. There's been a few questions that we can talk about. One was whether, if you want to refer back to these slides, uh, they will be available on our website within several days. You can go in and, you know, if you wish to refer back to them or uh, have them for your own records, you can go and find them that way. Uh, I have a question about uh, specifics of documenting software development. I've often actually find that the software engineers tend to follow the pattern that I've been mentioning, I think, among the, the best. Uh, they do seem to have a fair amount of detail on what types of documents they're going to have. They seem to have references to often depositories for their test plans, their things. Uh, these are on, often online themselves, which does raise certain risks. I, you know, I often find the problem that computer systems, while they save everything, also tend to have a tendency to change over the years. Uh, I mean, you might consider whether you can electronically download samples from their databases while you're doing the collection and keep them on some type of, you know, storage device that won't change so that you have uh, samples of them 
when there is a uh, you know inquiry from the IRS on it. Uh, you know, it's, at one level, it's simpler to collect electronic documents because you know you're not printing them out, uh, and so that's easier. But I, I do think that in many software projects, that the, the number of them would make it unwieldy to have you know some type of backup hard drive in your office collecting all of them, so you would only want samples of them. I do tend to find, though, that just in general, in the software development area, the, you know, there's the waterfall process that they often talk about, that, uh, you know, that's how they develop them. There just does seem to be, I guess, not surprisingly, a, a more emphasis on their documentation, uh, since they really don't have a physical item that they're looking at, that it becomes more important for them to track the uh, uh, the items that are out there. So that's where I would look for those types of documents in the software area. Uh, I also have a question that there's about what is sort of basic research. And that, you know, that doesn't always fall within the, you know, the phrases that we've just been talking about. The, um, you know, that there you're actually trying to come up with which direction you want to go for your research that you haven't necessarily reached the concept stage of it. Uh, those documents uh, tend to have a more, in my experience, uh, individual nature to them. Uh, I think you want to, you know, if there is a sort of a basic research group at your company, you'll want to talk to those people about what they have. I have seen in some cases there being sort of a phase gating process even at the more basic research as to whether, you know, to, to go or no go with a particular line of research. Uh, those documents would be helpful if you have them in your particular company. Um, okay, I think we've kind of reached the end of our time. I don't want to keep people any longer than necessary. I appreciate uh, your participation. I, Mike and I hope that you find it uh, helpful. If, uh, you know, if you can give us any feedback on whether this has been useful or not useful, as I said, we. Uh, are thinking of doing a somewhat similar thing on the, the, the allocation issue, which has certain different uh, problems that are out there. If people were interested, that would certainly motivate me to take the time to do it. Uh, thank you all, and have a good day.